from Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. I'm David Weston, and welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. We begin today with the, the race for a COVID-19 vaccine. Earlier today, I spoke with Dr. Anthony Fauci. He's director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases about the way forward. Cannot durably end in the sense of truly putting it us behind us. Uh, the classical history of viruses, particularly respiratory viruses, are such that if they are going to be something that is as capable as this virus is of efficiently spreading from human to human, ultimately, if you really want to put the nail in the coffin of an outbreak, you're going to need a vaccine. However, and it's a big however, there are many things that we can do from a public health standpoint that can more adequately control this globally as well as domestically. And they are not particularly complicating things. They are things that we keep talking about, you know, five or six fundamental principles, things like wearing masks universally, indoor and outdoor, keeping six feet at least distance, uh, avoiding crowded places, uh, outdoors always better than indoors, having a clear cut fundamental awareness of the need to wash hands as frequently as you possibly can and stay away from places like bars where you congregate in crowded places. If we universally do that, and one of the problems we have in this country is that the understanding of the seriousness of this as a pandemic varies depending upon what demographic group you're in, because it's I've never seen an infection like this, where it goes from 40% of the people have no symptoms at all, very heavily weighted towards young people who do really quite well, to people who have minor symptoms, moderate symptoms, severe symptoms, hospitalization, intensive care, and death. So when somebody looks at it, depends upon what you're looking at it from what perspective. You know, if I'm a 75-year-old person with diabetes, and obesity, I'm going to be really concerned because I'm at a high risk of a deleterious and severe consequence. Whereas if I'm a millennial who's really quite healthy, you look at the statistics, and even though there's a misperception that those people don't ever get into trouble, they do, and there's more and more examples of that, for the most part, statistically, they do very well. So what happens is that when we talk about the things to do to avoid infection, they understandably and innocently think that, well, I'm in a vacuum, so it doesn't make any difference if I get infected because I'm not going to hurt anybody else. When in fact, even though you may not get any symptoms, what you're doing is that you're propagating the outbreak and that you will almost certainly, or one of your colleagues will infect someone else who will infect someone else who then infects somebody who really, really gets sick. So we've got to all pull together and the reason I'm giving you that somewhat long explanation is because we can do that if everybody universally does those fundamental public health things. And one of the messages we're getting from a lot of different sources are we're going to have to do that for some protective period of time. At the same time, people still keep hoping for that vaccine. And my question is, what is effective in a vaccine? Because what if we get a vaccine that's 50 percent effective or it's effective for three months or six months or something? Then what do we do? Okay, so let's talk about the percent effectiveness or efficient uh, efficacy and then durability because they're really separate, one at a time. If we had a 50, I hope it's going to be more than 70. But even if it's 50, 60, a 50 to 60 percent effective vaccine is totally value added if you complement it with public health measures. So give you an example historically, David. If you look at measles, measles is really an amazing vaccine. It's 97 to 98 percent effective. So in effect, the only thing you need to do with measles is vaccinate people, because the high degree of efficacy, which gives an amazing degree of herd immunity to the population, whereas when you have a vaccine for a disease in which you can do public health measures to mitigate against the spread, 
you put those two things together, and I'd love to have a 80, 90% effective, but if we get a 50 to 60% effective, I'll feel good about that. With regard to durability, that's a different story. No question about it that if you get a vaccine, you're going to at least have several months protection to get you through a season. If it turns out that you get more than that, well, all the better. If it turns out you need to boost someone, that's okay, too. We can give a booster shot the way we give booster shots for other vaccines. So as a practical matter, who's ahead in this race, as far as you can tell, in finding a vaccine that would be efficacious? You know, it depends on what you mean by temporally ahead or eff efficacy ahead. There's no one that's ahead efficacy because the proof of the pudding is that you need to do the large phase three clinical trial to determine efficacy and to confirm safety. There are a number of vaccines that have already entered phase three trial. There's one from England that is doing one in Brazil and South Africa. There is one that we started here in the 27th of July with Moderna. Pfizer started on the 27th of July. There are other companies that are going to be starting in the next month or two or three. So you're talking about five or six or more companies, each of which have started at different times. We don't know which one is going to be better than the other. And you know what I hope? I hope they're all equivalently good because that's what we need. We need vaccines not only for the United States, we need vaccines for the whole world. Uh, Dr. Pacha, are you at all concerned that in the rush, and there's an undoubted rush to try to come up with a vaccine, we may run risks? As I have read about when the polio vaccine was first developed, the first round of that was really actually deleterious to a lot of children who became paralyzed and even died from it. They had to go back and sort of reinvent it. Are you worried that we will forego some of the safety that we need in developing that first vaccine here? We, we pay particular attention to safety and the rapidity with which we are moving relates more to technological advances in how you can make a vaccine even before you start testing it. That makes me confident that we are going to do everything we can to determine safety. So when we talk about speed, it doesn't mean sacrificing safety considerations, nor does it mean sacrificing scientific integrity. It means we've been able to do things more quickly because of risks that we take financially. So when people hear risk, they think, oh, is that a risk to me? No, it means that you do things in advance of making investments in preparing clinical trial sites and even starting to manufacture the vaccine before you even know it works. When you do that, if it works, you've saved several months. If it doesn't work, the only thing you've lost is money. And since this is such an urgent situation, the federal government feels it's worth the financial risk to get extra months of it. So it's not going to be a risk of safety. Uh, so the people at large, I think, are really focused on vaccine. Are there some uh, near solutions in the therapeutics and some of the antibody therapeutics from places like Regeneron and Eli Lilly that we read about? Could they be something of a substitute for a vaccine? Absolutely. In fact, yesterday, we started and announced two trials for treatment, one for the treatment of outpatients who aren't serious enough to be hospitalized, and the other for hospitalized patients who don't have severe disease. That's the Lilly monoclonal antibody, which is a natural product that directly is involved in blocking the virus from binding to the receptor on your cell. That's for treatment. You could also use that for prophylaxis. And other companies have been using it. In fact, Lilly even had another separate one in which they actually have a prevention for people at high risk. Regeneron has a product. Others have product. So there's a lot of activity with monoclonal antibodies. And you're correct. If we show that a monoclonal antibody, which is directed against the virus, can at least over a finite period of time protect people, we can operationalize that before we have a vaccine that's safe and effective. 
So, Dr. Fauci, as you say, uh, we would like this to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen tomorrow. In the meantime, we need to take some a lot of activities that you've already described that we should be taking in terms of social distancing, wearing masks, and things like that. Should we have a national policy that actually requires some of those activities more than just guidelines? And let me give you one, for example. It seems to me at this point, masks, everyone agrees if everyone wore a mask for some period of time, it would really help us in fighting this disease. Why don't we have a requirement nationally to wear masks? You know, I mean, obviously there are some that will argue back and forth. I mean, for me as a public health official, obviously I would like the consideration that everybody wears a mask. We live in a country, as you well know, in which the states have a lot of responsibility. And there is pushback. And one of the concerns, I'm not saying it's the overriding concern, but let me tell you what I hear when people speak about this, is that when you mandate something, A, you're going to have to essentially enforce it. And will the energy that's put into enforcing actually be a distraction? Will some people push back more when you mandate? For me, I'm not necessarily think that that's the best route to go of not mandating it, but that's not my decision. The issue is, if we uniformly and consistently give the message that it is extremely important for everyone to wear a mask, that could be as good as a mandate, because there may be some pushback about mandates. The bottom line is the vice president is now consistently wearing a mask. We've seen the president tweet about wearing masks and wearing masks himself. I think we have a consistent message right now. Well, well, not to quibble, Dr. Fauci, but I saw a photograph of you with the task force in the Oval Office just yesterday. You had a mask on. Dr. Burks had a mask on. There, most of the people in that room did not. It did not. You were indoors. It did not look there was six feet distance. What kind of message is that sending when people around the country see that photo? Yeah, I know. That could be a confusing message, but what I think people don't understand and don't appreciate, that everybody in that room has gotten tested for a coronavirus infection and are negative. See, that's different. And that's something that's not the real world because <laughs> people on the outside can't be getting to You can't go in that room unless you're tested negative. And I tested negative anyway, but I wear the mask because I want to give the signal that there's no doubt that you should be wearing a mask. That was part of my conversation with Dr. Anthony Foucher of NIH. We're going to have much more of that conversation throughout this hour on Balance of Power. In the meantime, we want to welcome now Democratic Senator Mark Warner of Virginia. He serves as the ranking member of the Finance Committee and the vice chairman of the Select Committee of Intelligence. So thank you so much, Senator Warren, Warner, for being here. Let's start with the COVID-19 situation and particularly what's going on in Capitol Hill right now. There is a back and forth between Republicans and Democrats on the stimulus bill. There are provisions in there for things like testing, support to the states. What do we need out of Congress right now to help us fight this virus? Well, one thing, David, I think we need to actually follow what Dr. Fauci just said earlier, and stop sending these mixed messages about the need to wear a mask. If you're out, you should wear one of the masks. And every other industrial nation in the world that's taken on COVID has, um, has seen their rates decline uh, when the leadership uh, goes ahead and, and demonstrates uh, that wearing masks, following health officials makes good sense. Now, in terms of the COVID negotiations, I, I do think there's progress being made. You know, whether we get to a framework of a bill by Friday remains to be seen. I think there is a recognition um, that we need not only assistance for schools in terms of reopening, but those schools should be reopened based upon local decisions, not decisions out of Washington. There needs to be assistance for state and local governments, um, and they should be able to use that to make up for lost revenues. And there are a number of my Republican colleagues who are pushing that as well. Uh, I think there is going to be a consensus on additional funding for testing um, and for PPE. One of the things that's amazing to me is we're five months into this uh, virus, and we still don't have the capacity we need for PPE and the capacity we need for testing. I think we were making great progress until probably late May. Then I think everybody kind of lost a little focus when it appeared that we were going to be on a decline and uh, we're now paying the price for that and we're seeing in some of these some in some cases 
upwards of 10 and 12 days before you get a test back. And yeah, actually, basically I talk- that's I, I talked to Dr. Fauci about that very fact, and, and he said, look, we're doing better on the timing for some, but not nearly enough. He said, we're not doing well enough. But one of the things that I'm a little perplexed about is, why don't we have a national approach to testing? Dr. Fauci said it's sort of individual companies and individual states, but why don't we have a national approach? I saw there are six states now, some led by Democrats, some by Republicans, who have got sort of a little mini United States going on to try to address testing. Well, yeah. you ask a fair and intelligent question, and there is no rational reason why there's not a national strategy on testing. Every nation that has driven down the positivity rate has a national policy on testing. You know, the fact that we are still having states and hospital systems compete against each other is crazy. There is something called the Defense Production Act, which gives the President of the United States, in moments of national emergency, the ability to kind of harness the resources of our country uh, to basically direct uh, production of additional testing, production of additional PPE. I was on a call with a series of Virginia hospitals yesterday, and they are still buying testing equipment on the black market in China. I'm I'm sorry, not testing equipment, but PPE on the the black market in China. That is insane uh, in the United States of America, five months into this virus. That's why I commend the six states. One of those states was my state, Virginia, that joined this consortium because I think governors, and I was a a governor before I was a senator, you know, you can do a lot as a governor, but you don't have the access to to your whole nation's resources. And to set up a Virginia regime versus a Maryland regime makes no sense. We ought to have a national policy on testing and a national acquisition policy on PPE. Senator, as we talk about a compromise on the stimulus bill that you say we will get to, it looks like, more or less, uh, one of the things that strikes me is the support for state and local government. Because when last time I checked, there was a proposal of nearly a trillion dollars from the Democrats, and the Republicans had said zero. On the other subjects, the Republicans had something on the table. There was zero. Are we going to come out somewhere in between the zero and $900 billion? Yes, but I also think, um, to give my Republican colleagues some due here, they did put in $105 billion for K-12 education. So to a certain degree, you know, K-12 education is not a proxy for state and local governments by any means, but it does mean money um, from Washington into hard hit communities. And you know, if, if you dramatically increase the K-12 money, uh, you may take off some of the pressure on state and local. So I think there is a recognition. I, I look at my friend Bill Cassidy, Republican Senator from Louisiana, he put out a proposal for $500 billion for state and local government. Um, so I think there is a recognition that when states and localities who are losing money from lodging tax, meals tax, sales tax, when we've seen you know, uh, close to a million state and local government workers already laid off, uh, that you know, why simply pass this problem down uh, to the state, the state governments when those essential services, particularly as we get into school reopenings um, uh, would be a huge mistake. So I think we will come up with a compromise there. Uh, So, so Senator, let's turn to another subject that's really hot, so to speak, in Washington right now, and it is China and big tech that have come together. You had the big tech on the one side with the four big CEOs up there on antitrust concerns. On the other hand, we have President Trump going after TikTok uh, for national security reasons. Where are you on the need for us to have big tech in the United States, partly as a response to what China is doing as a matter of industrial policy? Well, for my background was all in technology for 20 years before I got into government. I was in the wireless industry. Two and a half years ago, I started a series of bipartisan classified briefings to business and education leaders around the country about the threats posed by the Communist Party in China. And I try to make clear I'm not anti-China, not anti-Chinese, clearly not anti-Chinese Americans, but I am very much against what President Xi Jinping and the Communist Party in China is doing because they have an organized plan on how they take their their tech companies. We we hear about TikTok, we hear about um, Huawei, we hear less about Alibaba and Badu and Tencent, but all of these great companies, I believe are in one way or another extensions of the Chinese government because at the end of the day, those companies are responsible to the Communist Party of China more than their shareholders. So the stage one was China warn American business and academia about the threat that China poses. Stage two is saying, let's make sure that we have an organized plan 
And in some cases, this may look like industrial policy, but when China allows you know, massive competition to start with, and then a national champion arises, and that national champion ends up with 70, 80% of the Chinese domestic market, as in the case of Huawei, and then they give a Huawei $100 billion backstop to go around and sell their products around the world, there's no way any American company or Western company for that matter can compete. So I think we need a strategy. That's why I've got a, a bill with John Cornyn that would put significant um, investment into our semiconductor industry. And that was included uh, in the Defense Authorization Act. But we also need to realize that American big tech needs some rules of the road. Here we are four years after the Russian intervention in our elections in 2016, and we still have no even basic disclosure requirements for political advertisements on, on Facebook or on Google. Um, we don't have any kind of basic disclosure requirements to allow consumers to know how much their data is worth to these companies. We ought to bring to them, um, in a more pro-competitive mean, I think we ought to be able to move our data easily. Right. If we're tired of how we're treated on Facebook, we ought to have data portability to a new site. These are certain things that we can add competitive nature to these right. the big platforms that are out there because um, there is this balance. We don't want them to get too big, but on the other right. hand, if we break them up and simply have them replaced by Chinese companies, that's not going to be good as well. Okay, thank you very much, Senator Warren. Really great to have you with us, as always. Thank that you, Senator I Mark that Warren. last answer. What? I, no, I, I, was trying to get, I was trying to get in both points. It's a, it's a complicated subject. I love and, and, well, and therefore, you should come back and, and really go through it, because as you say, you know this terribly well. You've been in these vineyards working for a long time. We'd love to have you back to discuss that at greater length on that subject specifically. But in the meantime, yes, thank you so much to Senator Mark Warner, Democrat of Virginia. Still ahead, we turn our attention to earnings. Disney posts a surprise profit, and it's taking Mulan straight into streaming. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We are watching Disney today after it announced earnings yesterday. And we turn out to Scarlett Fu for the story. Scarlett? Yeah, streaming saving the day for Disney shareholders, David. On a gap basis, Disney actually reported a loss, a first loss since 2001. The parks and the entertainment division, as you might imagine, was devastated because U.S. theme parks were shut for the entire three-month period. Cruise lines were grounded as well. Of course, movie theaters were closed, and there was no live sports for ESPN to broadcast. But if you take out certain expenses and charges on an adjusted basis, Disney posted an unexpected profit, and that actually was thanks to sports, specifically the absence of live sports. Disney deferred payments to the pro leagues because of game cancellations that led its TV networks to report a billion dollars more in income that flowed straight down. So, Scott, talk to me about streaming, because obviously Disney Plus is really big for them. They announced Mulan. They're going to take right to streaming, right from the big code. At the same time, they're losing money on it, right? When do they start making money? They're losing money on it, and the time frame doesn't change there, but there's a lot of excitement over what Disney can do with its streaming operations. It has over 100 million subscribers in total through Disney Plus, Hulu, and ESPN Plus. And that announcement that it will release the live-action uh, version of Mulan on Disney Plus as a pay-per-view really impressed analysts, although Disney did caution and say that that decision is a one-off. It's not necessarily going to be the model going forward. But really what analysts say is it shows how Disney can use its online channels to leverage all its different content, from Disney Classics to the Fox Library that it acquired last year to ESP ESPN Sports. Now, none of this, of course, David, changes the fact that Disney has to watch its bottom line like every other company. It is cutting costs. It's furloughing workers. It is tapping credit lines. It's cutting executive pay. Analysts do say that there's better visibility now on the company. Credit Suisse, for instance, says there are limited ways for investors to bet on streaming. Disney is now one of them, and Disney, as a result, becomes an eventual, eventual COVID recovery play for investors. Yeah, exactly, trying to get in line behind Netflix. Thank you so much to Scarlett Fu for that report on the Walt Disney Company. Up next, we're going to hear more of my interview with Dr. Anthony Fauci, including his comments about working with President Trump on the pandemic and whom we should listen to when he and President Trump have a difference of opinion. That's coming up next on Balance of Power, on Bloomberg Television, and on Bloomberg Radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It is time now for Bloomberg First Word News. After that, we go to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. A Lebanese broadcaster says that workers welding a door started a fire that led to that massive warehouse explosion yesterday in Beirut. Authorities blame tons of volatile ammonium nitrate for the blast that killed at least 100 people and injured some 4,000 others. The chemical had been in storage since 2014, despite warnings that it posed a danger. White House and Democratic negotiators are trying to reach a deal on a stimulus relief package by the end of the week. They are under pressure to act. Millions of unemployed Americans just lost supplemental jobless benefits. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and the Senate's top Democrat Chuck Schumer are playing hardball. They've dismissed smaller scale proposals offered by the White House. The Democratic convention just keeps getting smaller. Bloomberg has learned that Joe Biden will not travel to Milwaukee this month to accept his party's nomination for president. That's due to concerns about the coronavirus. Biden's now expected to, to deliver his acceptance speech from Wilmington, Delaware, where he lives. President Trump says the coronavirus is going away. He told Fox News today that, quote, this thing's going away. It will go away like things go away. The president also pushed for schools to reopen. He said inaccurately that children are almost immune to the virus. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thanks so much, Mark. Well, President Trump may say that the coronavirus is just going to go away, but when I talked earlier today with Dr. Anthony Fauci of NIH, he had a different view, saying it's going to take an effective virus, a vaccine before we get to that point. There's only one of the things that there's been disagreement about, and I asked Dr. Fauci about when we hear different things from the government about COVID-19 and whom we should believe. When you talk about the situation we're in now, we're in the middle of a pandemic, and we have other considerations that have to do with economic and political and other things. I have nothing to do with that. If you're talking about a medical question, listen to the medical experts. That's the advice. And you won't get a, you will not get a conflicting message from the medical experts about things like hydroxychloroquine, about what the results of a vaccine trial are, or what the results of monoclonal antibody. So when it comes to pure public health medical things, listen to what the medical experts say. How is President Trump getting his medical information as a practical matter? Because there seems to be some conflict on things like hydroxychloroquine and not limited to that. Is there a vetting of the information that, that he has access to? You know, I don't know that because I certainly don't have privy to all of the input into the president. The only thing that I know is what we do, and we do that through the task force, through the vice president, the vice president then briefs the president or, like we saw yesterday, the president invited us all to the Oval Office to brief him in person. So, so Dr. Fauci, uh, uh, let's look into your crystal ball right now. And assuming we don't have an effective, fully effective uh, vaccine in the next 18 to 24 months, what does a trading floor on Wall Street look like? What does a school look like? What does a public event look like? You know. I got to tell you, David, I believe, and I, and, I, and I sound like a broken record, which is good, because I want to sound like a broken record. And that is, there are things that we can do without shutting down the country that can get those numbers down to a manageable amount that you could do things that would be very productive and enhancing of the economy. We should not think of either lockdown completely or caution to the wind. There's a middle ground that we can do of the five or six things that I mentioned to you that will allow us to prudently and carefully open up the economy. It's not all or none. I think there's a misperception that unless we either lock down or open up, there's nothing in between. There is something in between. The issue is, and I, I, I want to give this a point because I really am going to, over the next days to weeks, keep repeating it over and over again. We got to make sure that all the links in the chain of the United States of America as a country, bringing that virus down to a level that we can function where we don't have to lock down, where we can revitalize the economy, 
We can do it, but all the links have got to work. You know, I, I, I use, you know, I'm trying to use analogies or metaphors that people understand. You could have a lot of people, a lot of states doing really well. When you have segments of the population that don't appreciate that even though they may not get sick from the virus, if they are careless and allow themselves to get infected, they're propagating the outbreak so it doesn't go away. And that kind of obviates all the good things that other people are doing to stay safe. I use the analogy only because I learned this from my daughter. My daughter, when she was in college, was on the varsity of a Division I crew team in college. And I used to go to those matches. And you're an eight-person boat. The only way you win the race, when every rower on that boat is doing it correctly, you get one rower on the boat that either accidentally, as they say, catch a crab and go off, or not doing it enough, the boat doesn't win. So it's the same thing. We're all in this together. Unless we all do it and do it correctly, we can get it down to the point where we can open. That was Dr. Anthony Fauci of the NIH. Joining me now to discuss the president's relationship with Dr. Fauci is Bloomberg White House reporter Josh Wingrove. So, Josh, I'm not sure that Dr. Fauci, a very distinguished individual, throws shade, but it felt like he sort of did that with the president saying, look, when it comes to things like hydroxychloroquine, listen to me. Don't listen to him. Yeah, absolutely. And that was one of a few examples in that interview where he at least indirectly pushed back at the information that President Trump is putting out there. Dr. Fauci tends to avoid getting into a full-on flame war with the president like most people do. It tends not to end very comfortably. Uh, but, you know, he, he the, the messages, particularly against that interview that Trump gave earlier today on Fox News, uh, really are, are stark. I mean, Trump is tweeting, reopen the schools. Uh, Dr. Fauci told you, you know, some schools should really think twice if they're in hotspot regions about reopening. Uh, you know, uh, we talk, Trump has talked about hydroxychloroquine, that clip you just played. You hear Dr. Fauci say, hey, listen to the medical experts on that. He made a point of noting that the vice president has started regularly wearing a mask in public. Other people are doing that, like the Treasury Secretary, the president still very rarely has worn a mask in public, although he has begun saying that it's a patriotic act to do so. So another sort of implicit one there. You know, there have been sort of a, an increasing gulf between President Trump and his health experts, not just Dr. Fauci, who was sort of the first one left out of the room. The last time Fauci spoke publicly at the White House was in April. Uh, but, you know, including Dr. Burks, who the president criticized this week. We've seen even uh, other officials like the head of the CDC uh, uh, criticize or at least push back on some of the information that the president is tossing out there. So, you know, there there, there is an ever-increasing gap between what the president says about this pandemic and what the health experts like Dr. Fauci are saying. Josh, I take the president at his word when he says things. I believe he believes them, and that's why he's saying them. At the same time, what are his advisors telling him about what this does in the election coming up? Is, is this a smart political strategy to run against, as it were, Anthony Fauci? Well, I mean, I, I'm not sure that they're running against Anthony Fauci. You know, the, the, I guess they seem to be clearly the president did not want to run with the virus at the position it is now. He wanted to reopen the economy. He wanted to have job numbers and, you know, um, you know, market numbers, everything rising as he as people started uh, thinking about what they were going to do in the polls. Uh, that hasn't happened. And so he's done this reset. But clearly, clearly, President Trump does not uh, view this the same way as either governors, many governors view it or as other world leaders view it. You know, we saw this with that Axios interview uh, that aired uh, earlier this week. You know, he believes that that, that the U.S. testing is generating more cases. Dr. Fauci told you today that they have to improve on testing, that they're just simply not cutting it when it comes to testing. Uh, yet another point of, of uh, contrast between the two. This is just like Trump just basically uh, has declined to continue to share the public health advice. You've seen just so many other uh, political leaders, Republican, Democrat, in the U.S., outside the U.S., lead. It's just he, he, he does not leave the impression that he views this as a particularly serious thing. And that may, of course, be hampering people's ability to buy in and therefore be delaying the ability to when we get to the other end of this bridge. Okay.
Josh, thank you so much for being with us. Always a pleasure. That's Bloomberg White House reporter Josh Wingrove. Coming up here, how do students safely go back to school in the fall? I pose that question to Dr. Anthony Foucher. Plus, Beth Akers, senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, on what the pandemic means for higher education. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. All week, Balance of Power has been addressing the question of sending students back to school this fall. Some school districts across the country have already tried to reopen and have had to close, at least temporarily. In the meantime, others have said they're only going to do remote learning. I asked Dr. Anthony Fauci about whether schools can reopen fully this fall safely. You should have a default position of what's your fundamental principle. The fundamental principle is that you should try as best as you possibly can to get the children back to school for reasons that when they're not in school, it's deleterious to the child, both psychologically and maybe even for nutrition. And then there are secondary downstream ripple effects for families that might have to stop work to take care of the children. So the goal should be to get them back. But then you have to have a but or however. And the however is fundamental to everything is the safety, the welfare, and the health of the children, of the teachers, and secondarily of the parents who may be interacting, which they obviously will, with their children. So if you look at our country, it's a big country, and you have to have flexibility because nothing is unidimensional here. You have some parts of the country where there's very little infection. And within, without any Impunity. I mean, with impunity, you could open up the schools in no problem. We call them the green uh, states. And then there are those that have some degree of activity in which you really want to do something like you're suggesting. Maybe a hybrid, physical spacing, masks, outdoor classes, whatever you want to do to mitigate any spread. But there are other areas of the country when at any given time, and it may be just temporary, where there's so much activity in the community that you really want to think twice before you start putting kids back to school. And if you're in that zone, you probably are going to have parents who are not going to want to bring their children back or teachers who are not going to want to show up. So when you talk about schools, David, you can't say the United States is one place. It's multiple regions. At the same time, how do we uh, create a sense of confidence, as you say, in teachers, in parents, in children, and students themselves, that you need to do these things, don't, don't cut them short, but if you do, you're reasonably safe? Because it's two messages, actually. You can't forego them, but if you do, it's probably going to be okay. Well, you know, I mean, that is a tough message. Uh, it is, because often... When you try in a way, I mean, take a look at some examples. There have been examples of schools that have opened where, you know, on day one, you wind up having children infected. We're going to have to have a policy which is still now. And first of all, I think we, we didn't mention one thing that's important. The CDC has put a lot of work into giving guidelines about how one can mitigate the spread of infection and the transmission of infection in schools. I think people should take a look at those guidelines. Uh, Dr. Fauci, uh, Larry Summers, you know him, former Treasury Secretary, economist from Harvard, has said, actually on Bloomberg, that what we're doing essentially is launching thousands of cruise ships this fall with a bunch of 19-year-olds, and he's referring to the dorms in universities. Does he have a point? Well, if not done correctly, that you could have, because when you congregate people together. But if you look at what some of the universities are doing, who are opening, a lot of them are doing something similar in some respects to what the, some of the major league sports are doing, where they're testing everybody once to get there and then intermittently surveilling and then trying to determine if you do get an infection, get that person out and put them in a sequestered way. So some colleges, as you know, are going online completely. Some are doing online for certain of the years of college and in person and others, and some are doing it completely open, but we're doing a lot of testing. Again, it's not one size fits all.
That was Dr. Anthony Fauci. He's director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. We were speaking together earlier today. For more on the way forward, particularly when it comes to colleges and universities, we welcome now Beth Akers. She's senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. She formerly served as an economist with the White House Council of Economic Advisors under President George W. Bush. Welcome, Beth. It's great to have you with us. You heard what he said. Give us a sense from your perspective. What is the strain and stress being put on universities and colleges across the country this fall? Yeah, to be frank, it's really a financial one. Colleges and universities, especially those that focus on that immersive in-person experience for their student, in other words, the very expensive ones, they're in a lot of trouble if they can't bring students back. That's because a surprising amount of their revenue comes from housing students on campus. That's the, the dorm fees, the food services that are on campus, and the other auxiliary services, even things like parking. Um, so colleges are having to really battle with whether to bring students back and try to keep a hold on the, the COVID crisis on campus or have to forego those revenues. And it's a really sticky point for a lot of these colleges right now. Well, and, and did a lot of these college and universities have some sticky points even before the pandemic came? There's a lot of strain, isn't there, financially in terms of the business model on a lot of colleges across the country? Yeah, so there's actually a lot of colleges who were already right on the edge financially before this moment. So uh, we're going to see a lot of headlines about expensive places like Williams or Harvard giving like small refunds to their students because of having to go to a virtual experience. That's just something that's absolutely not affordable for the vast majority of colleges in this country, especially those that are operating, you know, through public university systems, community colleges and things like that. Um, these these folks are, are running a tight budget from year to year, and this is potentially disastrous for them. And what does what happens to the curriculum, as it were? I mean, if you're doing remote, either partially or entirely remote, do we have any sense of what might be lost, if anything, in, ter in terms of pedagogy? Yeah, so in theory, online education is this absolutely fantastic innovation, right? Higher education can reach all kinds of people that it never reached before because of it. It's low cost. In practice, what's happening is that we have a lot of overstressed faculty, a lot of them with small children at home because they're not in school, rushing to put what was a traditional in-person class onto a Zoom format, which you know is really challenging. Um, and I question whether they'll be able to do it successfully, not because I question their competence, but because it's a huge ask to basically make this transition in a very short period of time. So I'm, I'm sure they're all be doing their very best to help their students, but I'm, I'm very concerned about quality. At the same time, Beth, it takes at least two to tango. That is to say, it's not just whether the students and the parents sending the kids are willing to do this. It's also a question of whether the instructors are willing to show up, but particularly when you have some elderly people or people with underlying conditions at these colleges and universities. Do we have any sense of how many college professors, associate professors, assistant professors are going to show up this fall? Yeah, that's a great question. There has already been some conflict between faculty and universities about what justifies a reasonable excuse for them to not want to do in-person teaching in the case that the university actually wants them to do it. So I expect that we'll see more of those confrontations as we get closer to the start of the semester. We have a lot of colleges saying they're going to be in person at this point. And over the weeks, we're seeing more and more dropping out and going to that virtual setting. So I think a lot of faculty might be kind of just hoping or, or waiting and potentially hoping uh, that their college goes online so that they don't need to, to confront that. Beth, none of us would have liked to, this to, to have happened. At the same time, is it possible there could be some silver lining here, that some fundamental structural changes may come about in college and universities that were overdue? I hope so. And I think it's probably hard for college administrators and faculty to think about that in this moment. But I sit outside of academia, so it's easier for me to imagine a future. Um, but, you know, over the past couple decades, we've had online education enter the marketplace. But I think there's been a lack in that innovation. We haven't really put those technologies for online education to their best use. And I think there's a lot more we could do rather than just taking a face-to-face -face class and slapping it up on the internet, um, taking advantage of ways that classes could be more efficient, more cost-effective. I think forcing colleges today to get those technologies in place will allow for more potential innovations that can make colleges more efficient in the future. So that's the silver lining if there is one. Okay, we can keep our fingers crossed. Thank you so much, Beth. That's Beth Akers. She's senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and former economist on the White House Council of Economic Advisors under President George W. Bush. From New York, this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on Bloomberg Radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Professional sports are getting back underway, but we've already seen some Major League Baseball games canceled because of the virus. I asked Dr. Anthony Fauci if he thinks the MLB will be able to complete its season. I've spoken to many of the uh, officials of the league and of different teams, uh, particularly my own team that's mine here in Washington is the Washington Nationals. They are very serious about the safety and the welfare of the players and the personnel. They're obviously playing to an empty stand, so you don't have to worry much about the, the, the spectators. But for the players themselves, they're doing everything they can to make it safe and to make it enjoyable. We've had some setbacks. We saw what happened with the outbreak of the Miami Marlins. We also have seen now infections with the St. Louis Cardinals. Whether that's going to be sustainable for the season, I don't know. But I know that they are making sure that they are going to act in accordance with the safety of the players. And that's baseball, which we typically don't think of as a contact sport. How could it possibly work for football? Because the NFL looks like they're going to try to go ahead. You know, I can't surmise on that because when I do, it gets taken out of context. I am not the context. I'm not the gatekeeper of sports. I can only tell when people ask me what risks are and one can do to mitigate the risk. The decision about what a sports team is going to do is left up to the very competent medical advisors they have and to the officials and owners and even the players themselves, because the players have a lot to say about this also. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you how your arm's doing. Is it recovered? Are you ready for throwing out another first pitch? (laughs) (laughs) A, my arm has recovered. B, I think I've made enough of whatever you want to call it, a spectacle with that line drive that I threw towards first base instead of to the catcher. I think I'll just stay to watching the games on television from now on. And you can catch much more of my interview with Dr. Anthony Fauci in the second hour of Balance of Power on the radio, and where I ask him about a national testing plan and much more. Spoiler alert, he suggests we're not doing enough on testing. We have a ways to go, despite all the progress that has been made. That does it for this hour of Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television Radio from New York. 